Thank you for attending this webinar brought to you by Tactile Medical. We are excited to have Dr. Stubblefield with us this evening to talk about radiation fibrosis syndrome. Dr. Stubblefield is the Medical Director for Cancer Rehabilitation at the Kessler Institute for Rehabilitation, and he has many years of experience on this topic. This webinar will be recorded and there will be time for questions at the end. If you do have a question, please click the Q&A icon near the bottom of your screen and type it there. Dr. Stubblefield, thank you for joining us. I'm going to turn it over to you. All right, thank you. Hi, everybody. Well, first of all, I can't see any of you, so, uh, but I'm assuming you can see me. So what I want you to know about that is one, I have not actually had a jacket on in like six months. So thank you for giving me the opportunity. Um, and I am wearing Birkenstocks without socks because I, I thought it would be rude to do otherwise. Um, you know, going barefoot for an important talk is just not, not good for me. Um, I want to welcome you to this. Um, I, it's something that I really enjoy talking about um, and a group of patients that are very challenging but very gratifying to treat. So I'm the Medical Director for Cancer Rehabilitation at the Kessler Institute for Rehabilitation. I'm also the National Medical Director for all the cancer programs for select medical, particularly our Revital Cancer Rehabilitation, which if you don't know is this big national comprehensive cancer rehab program. And I'm clinical professor of physical medicine and rehabilitation at Rutgers in New Jersey. All right, um, other things you wanna know about me is when I'm not playing doctor, I'm a wildlife photographer. So uh, all the photos in this, including those of the patients who I do not count as wildlife um, are mine. I'm the editor of Cancer Rehabilitation Principles and Practice, and I'm on the Scientific Advisory Board uh, for Tactile Medical, which is a place I really enjoy being. All right, so what we want to do here is we want to talk about the principles of radiation therapy. We want to talk about how people get radiation fibrosis, what contributes to radiation fibrosis. We want to talk about the clinical manifestations of radiation fibrosis and how you can identify those in your clinical practice. We want to talk about the role of lymphedema in the pathogenesis of radiation fibrosis. And finally, I don't want to leave you empty handed, we want to talk a little bit about how you can improve function and quality of life of head and neck cancer patients, particularly with radiation fibrosis. All right, so I'm going to start with the case. Um, always a, a, a fun place. I have I have no idea how many head and neck cancer patients, but head and neck and also Hodgkin's are a huge part of my clinical practice. So this particular patient's a 61-year-old man diagnosed with nasal pharyngeal cancer in 2004. He got combined chemo radiation, including, you know, probably carbo. He didn't have all the records because um, he was treated so long ago and the patient, of course, didn't know and couldn't get them. Uh, he reported his 5,300 rats, which is reasonable at 35 fractions. Um, he said his radiation oncologist is now uh, no longer with us. So a few years later, 2012, he developed left jaw osteoradionecrosis in the setting of a tooth infection with subsequent fracture. This is a common thing we see in this group. He underwent resection and placement of a titanium and ultimately a right fibular flap as the first one failed in October 12. Um, and then he received hyperbaric oxygen to help heal uh, that, that fracture and fibular flap and, and everything combined. So he comes to me for evaluation and treatment, and I, I always say this in my notes because it's always the same, multiple neuromuscular, musculoskeletal pain, functional, and usually also visceral-late effects, including, uh, you know, can be carotid, stenosis, etc. All right, so here's my guy. Um, I've been seeing him regularly since this time, and, and when you look at him, you see quite a few things, right? The jaw is deviated to the left. He's got a big flap here. He's got radiation changes in the neck. Oh, look, lymphedema of the face and the neck, pretty apparent. A lot of atrophy in the neck. And when you look on the back, the whole neck is atrophic. It's, it's small. You can see the scapula are prominent. And frankly, if this is midline, they're actually winged a little bit laterally, kind of symmetrically already. He doesn't have terrible trismus, but you know, he doesn't open the jaw well. He's certainly got a, some weakness of the muscles on this side of the face. All right, so enough of the anatomy lesson. So now we get the fun part of our talk. We get to pop some questions. So which of these impairments is most likely? Now's everybody's chance to vote. Oh my God, this is a good group. 
And the fun thing here is I will get a sense of how many people are actually on paying attention because yeah, we're up to like, you know, 150 votes already. Wow. I'm just going to sit here and enjoy this for the next few seconds. All right, absolutely. So I, I think the majority of you folks got this spot on. Uh, head and neck cancer, the radiation late effects affect all sorts of systems. So cervical dystonia is common, meaning spasm of the neck, which he has. Shoulder dysfunction, common, not just because the spinal accessory nerve is damaged, uh, but because other neuromuscular structures are damaged as well. Well, dysphagia, dysarthria, very common, lymphedema, very common. So those of you who guessed all of the above, which is 86%, absolutely. All right. So common impairments here, again, neck pain, dropped head syndrome, trouble lifting the head up, impaired neck range of motion. Those often come as a cluster. They can be very debilitating. Shoulder dysfunction for a variety of reasons. Head and neck lymphedema. I've seen it extend into the arms as well. Trismus, trouble opening the mouth, normal openings about 35 millimeters, dysphagia, dysarthria, and others are all common, common impairments in this group. All right. So another one of my head and neck cancer patients who interestingly enjoys rock climbing, which after I told you about all the shoulder dysfunction, you wouldn't expect that he's really quite good at it. Um, his big problem actually is trismus, which we're, we had great success with. He got an infection fracture, and now we're working on it again, but we're going to get there. All right. So understanding the late effects in, in head and neck cancer and other patients uh, treated by radiation really requires you to understand a little bit about radiation. So I'm sitting here in, in light. You're all sitting here in light. I've got a little thing over here that I use for such talks. So I am currently being bombarded by radiation as we all are. We're used to that. Regular radiation is fine. That's how we see. Um, most of the, the light energy that we're seeing, that's photons, as, as I think we all know. We use this and we use very high energy, meaning oscillating at a very fast speed, um, radiation to, to do our bidding in terms of cancer treatment. And there are two basic sort of forms of radiation we use. One is the photons, the light energy, and the other one is protons, which um, have become kind of the in vogue thing to do, and they certainly have some benefits, so I want to talk about those. Rarely, not, in, not at all, but, you know, in head and neck cancer, nasal pharyngeal cancers will often be treated just with radiation with or without chemo. Most of them you get some degree of surgery. So you do need to be careful to try to understand that the surgery is not a free lunch and it can cause a lot of neuromuscular damage as well. Um, side effects we can think about as short term. That's usually handled by the oncology team providing treatment. They're much better at that certainly than I am. But the long term, these late effects, those are the thing that for me as a cancer rehab physician is where I really make my money. All right. So the difference between protons and photons. So over here, I liken a photon to like a bullet. You fire the bullet, it, it actually builds up speed going through the, the barrel of the gun, hits maximal velocity when it is released, really very much like a photon. And then as soon as it hits the air, it starts losing energy. And if it hits something like a wall or anything else, it starts rapidly losing the energy. So as you can imagine, photons, light energy, have a very high entry um, energy, right, which rapidly divides off. So if you're trying to hit a target deep inside somebody, you're going to have this high energy initially that's going to fall off. So you're going to have a lot of damage at the entry point. Protons are, are very different. Protons, I liken to torpedoes. You know, if you were hit with a torpedo, even if it doesn't explode, it's going to leave a mark. So there's energy from it just traveling along. But it is designed that when it gets to its target, it has this explosive release of energy that deposits the vast majority of energy right on the target. And that's what protons. So you can see the obvious thing that you can get protons deep inside the body before they really release that energy because they're particles as opposed to waves. And that has a theoretical, and I'm gonna really caution you, theoretical benefit in head and neck cancer patients and other patients. The reason I'm gonna caution you is because again, it's not a free lunch. All of the stuff that's really important um, in terms of neuromuscular damage, or at least the vast majority of it, the nerves, the arteries, the lymphatics, um, are all right where the cancer is. 
which means that you can have very, very severe injuries from protons. And now that they're used more, I, I see them all the time. So don't think, oh, just because they got proton therapy, everything's honky-dory. It's not. These, these patients can have significant energy or significant injuries. And we've really just started to see the sort of the, the beginning of, of, of what we're going to see from these has become more common in clinical practice. All right. So important to also understand dosing because this gets a lot of confusion. And for those of you who aren't doing this all the time, when I'm teaching my residents and the therapists I work with is you really want to pay attention to dosing. You want to have kind of a, a true north. And I'm, I'm going to give you a hint. True north for me is 50 gray or 5,000 centigrade. So the basic unit of radiation is one gray. Um, not to get too technical, it's the absorption of a joule of radiation energy per kilogram of matter. And one gray is 100 centigrade or 100 rad. So a dose of 36 gray would be 3,600 centigrade or 3,600 rads for somebody who was treated later. And I told you, and I'll come back to that 50 or the 5,000 centigrade or rad is kind of your true north. So I'm going to talk to you about how that can be incorporated into your plan of care. So you have to think in terms of two things with radiation. You have to think, um, well, multiple things, but two things in terms of dosing. And if a patient comes in, what are they gonna tell you? Oh, doc, I got 35 treatments. Pretty standard, I got 30 treatments, 35 treatments. It was horrible. That tells you nothing, right? You need to know either the total dose they got or the number of fractions, the number of individual treatments. So for a head and neck cancer patient, we'll commonly get say 70 gray, right? they will have gotten 35 treatments of two gray. And when you have that information, knowing the total dose and the size of them will really help you understand how likely they are to have radiation injury. And I'll show you that in a minute as well. All right. The way we give radiation, other than just the total dose, the fractions is also important. So conventional radiation is like an X-ray. So here it is, this is for a spine tumor. So this vertebral body right here, clearly in a breast cancer patient, no breast here, implant over here, um, has tumor in it. It's the target. So with conventional radiation, the bullets, like I told you, have this high entry dose shown here in red, right, to get to the target. When you're coming from this way, boy, also a big problem. So this is conventional radiation where you radiate sort of front to back. You might have blocks blocking the patient, particularly in the olden days. Um, here you use a lower dose per fraction. You cannot use a high dose because it causes too much damage. You have to use more fractions. It's easier to do. It's faster to do. It's cheaper to do. You can do very big volumes. But again, you get these hot spots at the surface. This is conformal radiation. Technically, this is stereotactic radiation surgery, or SRS. Also, for a spine tumor, this is the same sort of target that you would have in this patient. But now what you're doing is you're bringing these beams in from multiple directions. And you know how big a beam to bring in and how powerful a beam to bring in because you've used imaging, in this case, CAT scans, to look at what you want to and let the computer calculate out, which takes a very long time and uses a lot of computing power, exactly where the beams need to come from in the power. What's the beauty of this? You get much lower entry dose because the, the beams are converging. It's kind of like, you know, Ghostbusters, remember, when they're like, don't cross the beams? It's more like that, where, where one area, no significant damage, but where they are focused, you get a very significant damage. But this costs a lot more. Um, you can get higher dose per fraction. So in radiosurgery, over here, you might be do 30 gray. Um, 3,000 centigrade would be standard dose for a spine tumor in 10 treatments of 300 centigrade. Standard. Here, you can do 24 gray as standard, 2400 centigrade in one treatment. That's why it's called radiosurgery. And it's very toxic to the tumor that you're going out, and it can turn tumors that were previously um, not, would just laugh at the radiation, like, you know, melanoma or colon cancer, and basically turn them into wood. Um, they, they become so avascular. And again, it's not a free lunch, but it's a difference. So in head and neck, we use a similar technology called IMRT, intensity modulated radiation therapy, where they use these leaf columnators coming in and out of the field to adjust the dose of radiation. All right. So understanding another head and neck cancer patient. I seem to like shooting head and neck cancer patients and their families doing fun things like this guy was surfing. So anyway, good looking family there. All right. So question number two. What is the structure least likely to be damaged by radiation? 
And I know it's mean because I didn't give you an all of the above. Oh, we now have 274 people on here. This is impressive. Appreciate everybody showing up. Interesting. All right. So not as this was a harder question, um, and I'll show you in a minute, I believe the answer to this one would be nerve. Um, the one that is most likely to be damaged is actually the lung. And we'll, we'll come back to this in a minute. All right. So two concepts you need to understand. One is radiation fibrosis. The other one is radiation fibrosis syndrome. So radiation fibrosis is this insidious pathologic tissue hardening that occurs in response to radiation. We can go into you know, the pathophysiology, but it's basically depositing fibrin, which is a normal protein, but depositing it abnormally in microscopic blood vessels. And there's certainly other changes, but that's kind of the way I see it. Um, the term radiation fibrosis syndrome, or all the bad things that happen to you, is a result of radiation fibrosis. So the trismus, the cervical dystonia, the shoulder problems, the cardiac issues, the lung issues, all of those are components of radiation fibrosis syndrome. So it happens over time. So initially it's like asymptomatic, there's some chronic inflammation, the endothelial cells aligning with the blood vessels aren't working problem properly. Later you start getting this organized fibrosis where there's dead sheets of this fibrin being laid down and all these poor little fibrocytes sitting in there, you know, basically gasping, you know, for, for nutrients, right? Because it can't get through the fibrin and then they ultimately die and you get this retractile fibrosis. And that's, that's sort of, you know, and, and probably varies some in different tissues, but that's the way I conceptualize the, the process of radiation fibrosis. And a lot of things will impact if you're gonna get it or not. So we already talked about total dose, right? The higher the total dose, the more likely you are to have radiation fibrosis, but the size of the fraction is important also. I told you with radio surgery, we can give a huge dose in one treatment. Right, so it becomes less about the total dose in that case with this new technology than about the size of the fraction you gave it in. Other treatments, so the fact that the patient had a, a, a neck dissection or they had bad vascular disease to begin with or they had scleroderma or something like that, um, which, I'm sorry, it's a medical treatment, their oncologic treatment actually impacts. The type of tissue, as I said, nerve is actually relatively radio or resistant and lung is relatively sensitive. Um, protoplasm, so that's like your scleroderma, that's the diabetes the patient had, or bad osteoarthritis. So by that, I mean all of those prior and developing medical issues the patient has. And then the big one is time. Radiation fibrosis and radiation fibrosis syndrome are the gifts that keep on giving. They get worse over time. They never stop. The textbook used to say, oh, it can go on for 20 years. That's because nobody ever lived longer than 20 years. Now I have patients approaching 50 years from their Hodgkin's treatment, for instance, that have been developing and progressive um, different manifestations of radiation fibrosis syndrome. So tissue sensitivity, here you go. So joint, actually, you, you guys were close to right, but actually nerve is relatively radio sensitive. And this is an old study. I mean, you know, I published it in 17 and I, I kind of made this, this graph from another study that was, you know, probably 20 years old. I don't think we've really spent a lot of time revisiting this, um, but it, it gives you kind of a, a representation of, of nerve over here and joint and bone, and then all of the viscera over here being relatively more likely to be damaged by radiation. All right, so I told you that 50 gray, and I, I like to keep repeating that because I'm, I'm really hoping you all start paying attention to the, the total dose and the size of the fractions and the technique used for radiation. Um, this is a very interesting sort of meta-analysis of, of brachioplexopathy, which gives you a pretty good idea. So standard radiation for, for breast cancer, if you had to just pick, it's 50 gray, and 25 treatments of two gray each, right? If you do that and the plexus is involved, right? If you're doing the chest wall, as opposed to just the breasts, your risk of damage is like less than 1%. You can go up on the size of the fractionation so long as you come down on the total dose. If you come off of that 50, you're still good. But if you start going up on both the total dose and the size of the fractionation, 
your risk of nerve injury starts going through the ceiling. And in head and neck cancer, everybody has a risk of nerve injury. You live long enough, your the vast majority of your patients are going to have some neural dysfunction as a result of standard radiation for head and neck cancer. Right? This is in, in, in breast cancer, but you know, having lived this world. So the common places that you see it, Hodgkin's lymphoma for me, and particularly historical Hodgkin's, right? This I love to talk about it. It's one of those things that was the first malignancies that we could really get good cure rates, certainly head and neck cancer. Breast cancer, we see it, particularly if the chest wall has been radiated, particularly if they've had metastatic disease, and metastatic disease of any other type. I would add to the sarcomas, really anywhere where you have to radiate at a fairly high dose, and there is a structure that can be damaged in the field. All right, and, and just showing you here, this is a tumor. So like I was saying, this head and neck tumor is running right with all some really, really, really important stuff, which is why these patients have such complications. All right. So the common late effects, I like to, you know, there's many ways you can look at them. Visceral, right? Every visceral organ can be damaged. Heart, lungs, endocrine system, any microvasculature or large vessels in it, the GI tract, the genitourinary tract, everything is free, is, is, is gonna potentially be damaged. And remember, it's the stuff that's in the field, that's in the actual treatment zone of radiation. So if you were radiated here for head and neck cancer, you're not gonna have radiation fibrosis of the feet. That being said, your spinal cord is running through the field, so it can be damaged. So you can have symptoms in your feet, but the radiation fibrosis is up here. And on the neuromuscular side, start at the brain and work your way down. Brain, spinal cord, nerve root plexus, any peripheral nerves that are in the field and the muscles. And I call this usually relative, you know, usually the brain's not so involved in, in head and neck, but the spinal cord often is, even though we try to sculpt around that. And I call it a myeloradicular plexoneuromyopathy. I made it up, I use it, I publish it, I get through with it. I didn't know what else to call it. I thought about stubble field syndrome, but that was way too self-serving. So I went with myeloradicular plexoneuromyopathy. And it's really, it, it's just fun to say. All right. So myelopathy and radiation in Hodgkin's, it's been reported as high as 15%. Um, I think it's probably higher than that. And I see it in a fair number of my head and neck cancer patients too. The clinical manifestations are everything you would expect from myelopathy, but these patients are not generally frank spinal cord, like paraplegia or tetraplegia patients. Usually what you're seeing is brisk reflexes without obvious cervical or, or other areas of spinal stenosis on imaging. And I don't usually even get the imaging anymore unless it's somebody thinks at risk for that. You may even see upgoing toes. You'll see some clonus. I've had patients, particularly Hodgkin's, get the tercer sphincter dyssynergia. So the spinal cord absolutely is, is involved. And fatigue, they just get tired easy because they can't get the signal from here to there um, is, is a very common manifestation in these patients. The nerve roots, right? So particularly in head and neck, while we're trying to sculpt around the spinal cord, the nerve roots are absolutely fair game and they absolutely get a pretty good dose of radiation. They will get that full 70 gray in many instances. Um, this is in the lumbar spine, but you'll actually get these little cavernomas which enhance um, basically proving that there's radiculopathy in these patients. When you see it's, it's exactly what you expect in radiculopathy. The difference is here, it's often keeping company with some myelopathy and some plexopathy and neuropathy, so it's hard to sort it out. Um, in head and neck, the upper cervical, C5-6, are clinically usually the most affected in this group of patients. Plexopathy, again, here's a nice big plexus tumor. Uh, what you would standardly see in plexopathy, ranging from just weakness in the arm, again, hard to pull out from radiculopathy, and pain radiating down the arm, all the way to like a flail arm or inability to elevate, you know, the shoulder because the deltoids and biceps are weak with a relatively preserved hand and tricep extension. But I see plexopathy in this group literally all the time. And actually now because of protons, I'm seeing there was a, a dip from the standard IMRT treatment that I'm now starting to see more uh, from over, I would say overzealous, but from use of protons. I'm not one to define what overzealous is. Mononeuropathy. So I'll show you this. Any nerve in the radiation field will be damaged. It's often cranial nerves, phrenic nerve, anything that is in the field, the dorsal scapular nerve, the long thoracic nerve, all of those things are commonly damaged, right? So you're not going to get a carpal tunnel from this unless it's kind of a secondary thing. 
um, but you are absolutely going to have weak scapulates. So a patient who didn't even have neck dissection but have radiation in the neck will have a spinal accessory mononeuropathy and a weak scapula. Very common in this group. And then finally, myopathy. So the muscles in the field actually get a Niemelin rod myopathy. These are Niemelin rods. This was in Hodgkin's patients. I don't think this has been looked at in others, but I've done many, many, many EMGs on these patients. And, and what you see is these myopathic changes right next to these neuropathic changes because they have both processes going on. That's my calling this a myeloradiculoplexoneuromyopathy. All right. Anybody know what that is? If you did, I would not be able to, to answer it. It's a duck, correct? It's actually a black-bellied whistling duck and really a wonderful duck if you've never seen one. I, I'm happy to talk about it. So head and neck cancer. All right, so what structure is least likely to be included in the radiation field of a patient with nasopharyngeal cancer? Another hard question, I'm sorry. So fun to watch this go up and down. I really can watch that. I should have put in more questions just because this is so entertaining. All right. Okay. All right. Well, um, not quite right. So um, actually, I take it back. Yes, most people got it. Axillary nerve. So the carotid bodies are right here, right in the smack dab middle of it. The phrenic nerve I already talked about is right in the fit. The transverse cervical nerve is not one you think of. It comes off the cervical plexus. And then the spinal cord is absolutely in the radiation field, even though we try to sculpt around it. The axillary nerve, however, would usually be just outside of it. So great job to everybody answering that. It jumped a little bit, which is why I got confused. All right. So now for those of you who are just starting to wake up, this is important. So one of the big things for me with head and neck cancer patients is that these issues are predictable, right? We know that a head and neck cancer patient is likely to get complications of their treatment and complications of just getting older, which really do not work well together. So I'm a big proponent of what, um, for revital, we call prohab or prospective rehabilitation, prospective surveillance. But the idea is that we get in front of these problems and educate the patient so we don't get our patients showing up going, nobody told me I could have shoulder problems. I'm like, yes, yes, we told you. We have it in writing right here in the documentation we gave you about how this can do all of these things. So we really try to educate our patients. So I like to think of it along this continuum from treatment, which is initially diagnosis where they come, you know, if it's a 75-year-old guy with head and neck cancer, he's going to come with his diabetes and his hypertension and cervical stenosis, right? And then he's going to get surgery. And that resection and that neck dissection can cause a spinal accessory mononeuropathy, shoulder problems, cervical dystonia, trouble opening the mouth. He can get dysphagia dysarthria even from this, lymphedema and nerve pain, all just from that initial treatment. But wait, there's more. It sounds like a Ginsu knife commercial, right? Now we're going to give them chemo radiation, right? Now they're at risk for neuropathy, fortunately not as common in head and neck gait dysfunction, ADL impairments, more fatigue now than they got from the surgery, cognitive impairment, their lymphedema is going to get worse, their dysphagia dysarthria is going to get worse, right? All of these things are going to get worse. But wait, you know, there's still more. Now that we've done all of this treatment for them, they've got this ticking time bomb inside them of this DNA damage caused by the radiation, this gift that keeps on giving. So now they're going to end up with my myelo neuromyopathy and dropped head and cervical dystonia and osteonecrosis and depression, anxiety, trismus, more lymphedema, more dysphagia, more dysarthria, more shoulder dysfunction, et cetera. So we really want to be following these patients closely, no matter who you are out there um, listening to this, whether you're a physiatrist like me or you're a, a surgeon or you're an occupational or speech language or physical therapist, it following these people is important. All right. So the common disorders, we already said, myeloradicular plexoneuromyopathy. And the plexopathy cervical, which people forget, maybe go look that up if you haven't thought about the branches of the cervical plexus in a while, certainly the brachial plexus, multiple mononeuropathies, and then the muscles. And then all of these other dysphagia, dysarthria, et cetera, et cetera. All right. 
Remember also, these patients get various degrees of neck dissection. We don't know as many radicals anymore, but we certainly do. And here's a nice picture where sternocleidomastoid, missing. Internal jugular vein, gone. Carotid artery, probably clotted off. The scalenes, which you can see so nicely over here on the right, are just emulsified and melted together on the left. Right, so, so the neck dissection in this patient also had radiation can cause a lot of woe in, in this group of patients. So this is just looking, here's a IMRT, typical IMRT dose. You can see where the spinal cord, we're sculpting around, but not the nerve roots, plexus, or peripheral nerves out here. But look, the spinal cord is still getting 80% of the dose, which is, is fairly high. And the plexus in here, and you know, this particular, they had about 12% of symptoms consistent with brachial plexus. I don't know if that's right or wrong. Um, my sense is it's actually fairly high in this group. So here's a patient with cervical dystonia. You can see all the radiation changes here. You can see some tattoos from the radiation, lots of atrophy in the shoulder girdle as well as the neck, had a, a trach in place. He thinks his head is straight. He's dystonic to the side. You see the lymphedema. This guy also has trismus and shoulder dysfunction and pretty much everything else that I've already listed. Oh yeah, um, so most of the dropped head you're gonna see is, is really patients just saying, yeah, my neck hurts and it gets worse at the end of the day. And that's really just functional failure of the muscles that are not strong enough to hold the head up, which is made worse by them assuming this kyphotic boat-shaped posture, which gives us sort of something in therapy where we try to do a lot of myofascial work and get them open and a lot of neuromuscular re-education, proprioceptive training. People like to do like the shark with the laser on their heads. Uh, sort of thing where they'll put the little laser beam and have them write their name on a target and do all of that sort of stuff, which I think really helps. Usually they don't get to be this severe, but they can sometimes obviously get this severe where, you know, there's no bracing for this. She's fixed down here and just absolutely miserable. And this is a guy, just radiation. So there was no surgery for him, relatively young. The older I get, the younger he gets. 57-year-old uh, guy, 5-FU and IMRT, uh, just about 70 gray. Here's the tattoos. And you see, look at all that atrophy. That's only flexopathy, lateral winging, the depression of the shoulder and the spinal accessory nerve. Yeah, I don't know if that's atrophy or hypertrophy over here, but that is not a normal muscle. He's got lymphedema of the face and neck. And his big complaint was he flew a lot and he couldn't get anything into the overhead bin anymore. And, you know, he, I followed him for a long time when I was at Sloan Kettering, and he just got worse and worse over that time. Although we did keep him better than I think he would have been otherwise. Cranial mononeuropathies. Um, for those of you who aren't doing cranial nerve exams, if you're seeing a lot of head and neck cancer patients, I really encourage you to relearn how to do your cranial nerve exam. You will be shocked in what you see. And sometimes it's subtle. The tongue just goes a little bit to the side of the lesion. It's just a little bit atrophic. Sometimes it does this. You're going to see some subtle lateral winging and some obvious lateral winging. You're going to see the gag out in people, right? Uh, you're going to see facial nerve palsies. When you start testing sensation in the trigeminal nerve and the contraction of the master, you're going to see that the trigeminal nerve is commonly affected. So, and this has important clinical implications, so I think it's very well, well worth doing in this group. Trismus, inability to open the mouth. So, Normal is 35. Um, you know, I tell people out there, if you can get three fingers in your mouth, that's generally normal for you. Um, it's, it's considering how loud I am and how large I am, I can only usually get two in my mouth. So um, my small mouth belies my uh, large voice. Um, but this is a big problem in patients, right? They can't eat, they can't, you know, we can't check them for cancer recurrences. They got terrible halitosis. And it's really just miserable to have trismus. And while we don't have good data on it, I think all of us would suspect trismus is much easier to prevent than it is to treat. Um, you know, often we get these rapid acute trismus from a fracture or recurrence or whatever, but those that are just kind of gradually going along just due to radiation fibrosis, boy, we'd really like to get our paws on them earlier than later. And then lymphedema, right? Underdiagnosed in this group of patients. Um, you know, this is probably relatively old data. You know, the, the people I trust about this when we're looking at these folks, not just clinically, but with imaging, and I, I agree, we'll say pretty much 100% of head and neck cancer patients will have some degree of lymphedema. Why is that important? Well, it's not for me just cosmetic. 
Um, radiation fibrosis, as I told you, is the slow, insidious fibrotic process. Well, what is lymphedema? It's a slow, insidious fibrotic process. So when a breast cancer patient gets lymphedema, we know that the protein that, that leaks out of, of the lymphatics starts setting up shop out in the, the interstitium and they get this brawny fibrotic sort of texture to the skin and the tissue that makes it much harder to, to get the lymph fluid out and they really move on to a later stage of lymphedema. We don't have good data on this. And, and you know, this isn't a CME talk, but I think I would, I would say the same thing. My suspicion is that in head and neck cancer patients that do have lymphedema, that lymphedema is compounding the fibrosis that we see from the radiation fibrosis. It's two great tastes that taste really bad together. And, and, I, and I think that if we can get that lymphedema out, it's, it's going to help these patients with a number of things. And I had this anecdotally when I was working at Sloan and Kettering where the patients and the therapists would say, yeah, we get the lymphedema out, their swallowing improves. We get the lymphedema out, their voice improves, their shoulder function improves. And that makes sense. Because a lot of what we're trying to do is proprioception. If you've got a big thick stripe of lymphedema and you can make that smaller, things are just gonna work better. And I think that's what we've seen clinically. And now we have a little bit of data to, prove, to, to back us up. All right. So effective management of lymphedema and head and neck cancer survivors is most likely to help with I'm very curious to see how everybody answers this. Hmm. Not leaving a whole, whole, whole lot to the imagination here, are you guys? Of which there's nearly 300 of you now, so thanks for that. All right, yep, you guys all get an A. So absolutely all of the above is the answer here. And again, our data on this is early. Um, but, but the data that we have is showing that pretty much everything I talked about, right? Breathing, um, pain, swallowing, right? Are all better controlled if, if we treat the lymphedema, in this case, specifically with the FlexiTouch device, which is our sponsor tonight. And for those of you who don't know, this is the device. Um, I've been giving these out pretty much to everybody who walks in my door now because nobody comes in with a problem that I don't think getting any fluid in them out is gonna be beneficial. So almost every head and neck cancer patient is getting a prescription for physical therapy for their cervical dystonia and their shoulder issues. They're almost all going to SLP for speech language pathology initial eval and a VSS, which may not have been done at baseline. So at least I have a baseline that I can follow these patients for. And they're all also going to occupational therapy because I'd already sent them to PT to get a lymphedema evaluation. And then literally at the same time, I am giving them an order uh, for the FlexiTouch. And you know, the device is pretty easy. Most of them love it. So far, my feedback's been great. We're at, I think, 32 minutes. I have some who use it a couple times a day. And uh, I'm happy to talk more about the, the results I've been anecdotally getting with it, but we have more data coming on it. All right. so. The principles of successful rehabilitation. Um, and I promise I give you a, a few little pearls. So the biggest thing is when somebody is sent to you with lymphedema or they're sent to you with shoulder problems or they're complaining to you of whatever, you really need to expand, particularly in head and neck cancer patients. These patients almost always have multiple deficits, which is why I'm sending everybody to PTOT SLP. Not because I'm trying to you know, make the therapist happy and make them a lot of money, but because these patients have issues. And I think if we can get them started early, we can keep the small issues from becoming big issues and train the patient how to be good self-managers of them, which will save us down the road and save their function and quality of life. So really work to collaborate with physicians of all types, rehab physicians. I know those of us who do cancer are relatively rare, but the oncologists, the surgeons, the neurologists, whoever you're working with, and then all of those groups. That's the way to get the best and safest improvement in these patients. And again, think prospectively. You know, this concept of prohab, I think is absolutely critical. And, and, and you hear me saying prohab, not prehab. 
prehab is that tiny little bit sliver between when you're diagnosed and as soon as freaking possible, if I had cancer, you get a treatment, right? We, we want that to be basically the next day because cancers grow. It might be two or three weeks, depending on what you have. That's prehab. And that's important, don't get me wrong. But all of the real badness, for particularly breast cancer, head and neck cancer patients starts coming after that period. So being able to get in front of those issues is the best way to keep those patients at work and out of the emergency room and out of the hospital and just living their best lives. All right, so that's me taking some of the pictures that we did. And somebody commented, I have two cameras. I actually got three. I have one in, in my little fanny patch there. My wife has one. You can never have too many cameras. And this is us, I think, in Arctic Norway or something. And with that, I will leave you with a little awk or at least awklet and uh, open it up to questions. Thank you, Dr. Stubblefield. That was very informative. A lot of great information in that presentation. Uh, I've been keeping track of the questions and there have been a few that came in and a reminder, there's still time if anyone wants to submit more in the Q&A icon. So I have a couple questions that are related. Um, one, how many years after radiation therapy does the tissue continue to be affected that was radiated? And then this one is related, does the radiation damage begin to dissipate with the passage of time? Yeah, two great questions. So I'm gonna answer a question you didn't ask first, is how quickly can it start? And I've seen it start six weeks after radiation where it's clearly radiation fibrosis gonna progress. We do not understand why there is a huge bell curve that happens to do with that, you know, protoplasm I talked about, basically the patient's own genetics. Um, so I've seen it start very early in particularly the head and neck cancer patients. It progresses forever. It never stops progressing. So I, I think I quipped earlier that the textbooks used to say, oh, if this can continue up to 20 years. And now I'm literally seeing patients who are 40 and moving on 50 years out past their curative treatment for things like Hodgkin's lymphoma, who still have radiation fibrosis syndrome, which is continuing to progress. So it, it will never stop progressing. That doesn't mean that you can't symptomatically make them better, right? It, it's like you can, you know, theoretically get, you know, a 75-year-old person to run a marathon who's never ran before barring injuries and other things. It's a theoretic possibility. So even though their body is deteriorating, you can still make them function better but they are still gonna be a 75 year old person at the end of the day. And that's the same thing with this radiation fibrosis. It's almost like an accelerated aging in some ways, but it's really about that, that fibrin being deposited everywhere and the other little, uh, little microscopic insults that are going on. A great question. Um, we have a couple more talking about radio sensitivity. Um, what makes the structure more radio sensitive and how about lymph nodes? Are they highly radio sensitive? Yeah, another great question. So I actually don't know lymph nodes. My suspicion is because they're visceral organs. They're going to be on the left side of that curve, meaning more sensitive to damage than other structures. And certainly the lymphatics is a visceral organ. So what makes organs more sensitive probably is how many rapidly dividing cells there are. Right. So, so the heart was kind of on the, on the side that was least radio sensitive. It doesn't do a whole lot of division. The nerves don't do a whole lot of division. The stromal cells, the, the surrounding cells do, but the nerves themselves are pretty static. Bone doesn't do a tremendous amount of division. So, so the things that are, are going to be least damaged by radiation probably are those that are more static in terms of how rapidly they divide. The things that are very badly damaged are like the GI tract, where we're constantly turning over those cells, you know, your mouth, the, the mucous membranes, vaginal uh, membranes, those sorts of things are very badly damaged by radiation. Here's another one. What is the best way to identify or diagnose lymphedema and or radiation fibrosis for head and neck cancer patients? Yeah, so, so again, lymphedema is very easy. I literally assume that every patient who walks in the door who's had surgery and radiation has some degree of lymphedema. And it's really just my assumption you can diagnose it clinically just, you know, by seeing the asymmetry of swelling and just putting, you know, pressure on it. There's some uh, sort of research ways of doing it that I don't claim to be the expert at. We also are getting a better good sense. There's some very good data now that imaging, like the CT scans we use to follow these patients, will show widening of tissues that is consistent and believed to be uh, lymphedema. So, so that's one. 
Uh, for radiation fibrosis, right, it's really these constellation of symptoms. Everybody who's been treated with radiation will have some degree of fibrosis in those tissues. It's just going to happen. And it may be, you know, we think about the zero to 100 scale. Some people may be five, right? But others may be 75 or 100. And we don't know how severely affected they are except by the symptoms. So the important thing there is to identify the fact that, oh yeah, they've got some skin changes here and the sternocleidomastoid's tight and they can't move their neck. Oh yeah, and their shoulder's a little depressed and they can't elevate it completely and they have a little lymphedema on that side. It's really those clinical features that help you decide they have radiation fibrosis or it might be they're swallowing or that their voice is changing or that their neck's a little stiff. So all of those clinical things are what helps us diagnose. There's no gold standard for the diagnosis of, of either really lymphedema, um, maybe somebody will disagree with me on that, but certainly radiation fibrosis. Great question. Um, what type of damage should we expect with supraclavicular XRT? Right, so the way you have to think about that is what is in the field. So if you start thinking about what's in the, in, in the field here, brachial plexus, right, branches off the cervical plexus, are both in the field in terms of the nerves. Big arteries, big veins are gonna be in the field. Several muscles are gonna be in the field, including the insertion of the sternocleidomastoid. So the things that you're gonna start expecting are difficulty rotating the head, shoulder dysfunction, lymphedema in that side, carotid stenosis, which I didn't really talk about in this, right? So everything that I've talked about before is gonna be likely there. What will you not get? Trismus um, is, is less likely. Depending on how close to the midline they came, you're probably you're at risk for some dysphagia dysarthria, depending on if, if those structures were involved. Here are a couple that are related. Um, are there any treatments during radiation that can decrease fibrosis? And are there any medication or topical agents that can help reduce yeah. fibrosis? Yeah, good question. The short answer is not really. Um, they've, they've tried a bunch of things. None of them have really worn out. Um, Petoxyphylline and tocopherol, which is basically vitamin E, have been looked at in a number of studies, mostly done by one person, I think, in France. Um, and I've read through, I stopped reading the studies a long time ago, but I read through all of them at one point, and they were all pretty unconvincing. I mean, like, obviously very badly flawed studies. Um, so I have personally not put much stock in giving pentoxyphylene or, or tocopherol, I will do it. Um, often my patients come to having been put on it by somebody else, but I can't really remember a time where that saved the day. Even if I left the patient on it, you know, for two years, you know, that being said, it's, it's outside of study, but I don't think there's, certainly there's no magic effect there. It's not, not that impressive. Hyperbaric oxygen is another one that maybe somebody will ask. Um, in my entire career, I've had one patient who's had weakness improved with hyperbaric oxygen. He's also somebody who had pretty severe diabetes and he was a bit of a, and it was a pelvic, it was like a rectal cancer and a pelvic, a level sacral plexopathy that got better. I've had 100 head and neck cancer patients who've gone for hyperbaric oxygens over the course of my career. Maybe that's an overestimate, but it's been a number who've gone for various reasons. And they'll usually report, oh yeah, I got a little bit better and then it quickly goes away. It, it's never been a durable effect. We use a hyperbaric oxygen really to heal things like radio osteonecrosis, which is why they end up going, is to heal an ulcer that won't heal or a bone fracture that won't heal. Um, there are a couple on MLD. Uh, as, a lymphedema, as a lymphedema therapist, what are my precautions or contraindications with respect to radiation fibrosis in performing MLD, especially intraorally? And then how soon after or during radiation can a patient receive MLD or treatment? Yeah, that's, that's a, another great question. So I think, you know, when somebody's still red beefy from the radiation, they have a lot of local inflammation is probably not the best time. Some radiation oncologists may, you know, liberalize that a little bit because I don't know that we really know um, based on clinical evidence, at least that I'm aware of, of when the best time. When that settles down, I think it's absolutely reasonable to start the MLD. And it's the same thing. It's, it's kind of the standard. If, if they have an ulcer or they have an infection, um, those are the times when you'd be cautious around that area because you're not wanting to open up the wound more. 
That being said, it doesn't mean don't do MLD away from it because we think, you know, if, if you had a, you know, a fistula inside your mouth, decreasing the MLD everywhere else, um, but not putting traction on that to potentially open it up more will likely be helpful. Uh, here's one. I have several patients in my practice that their ENTs tell them they are still swollen from radiation up to three months after ending CRT. Yeah and they continue to wait when truly it appears that they have lymphedema, how would you approach this to effectively manage the issue? Yeah, unfortunately, you're gonna to have to negotiate that when with the treating oncologist, lest they get mad at you and stop making referrals. Um, you know, I think you're right. I think once, you know, three months, most of that inflammation has gone down. Um, they still may have some, but I think all of our experience who, who see a lot of these patients is, you know, going from three months to six months, the lymphedema is still there, I think, in a huge number of these patients. Um, so I would work with them to see, you know, what they're, why they would not want you to treat them. I would even open it up personally to more of a prospective thing. If you're just a lymphedema therapist, I don't think that means that you can't give them some neck range of motion and shoulder exercises and exercises for trismus and and other things that are more globally help them and you work that lymphedema into more of a global thing that might be more convincing to the referrer. But, you know, and unfortunately, you know, so many of, of the surgeons and radiation oncologists out there are gonna have different sensibilities when it comes to when to treat things. For a lymphoma patient who received radiation, do you recommend preventative treatment to avoid trismus or cervical issues like stretches, et cetera? Yeah, a great question. The answer is it depends, right? So the Hodgkin's patients that I talked about kind of through the talk, most of those are ones who are treated historically, not acutely, right? If somebody comes in acutely with a lymphoma in the neck, say, that just got radiated, it would be just like the head and neck cancer patient. I would want to start them on sort of gentle range of motion earlier and not do a lot of manual work while they're still in, inflamed. Um, but as that inflammation comes down, start gradually incorporating a lot more manual work. And, you know, when is too early to do it? You know, just like with head and neck, as soon as that red beefiness starts going away and the patient can tolerate you touching them and you're not worried about breaking the skin or, or really upsetting the subcutaneous tissue, then I think it's reasonable to start, you know, slowly incorporating it as tolerated. Okay. Um... Let's see, there are still a lot of questions, so this is great. Um, here's one, do you send patients for manual lymphedema treatment in addition to prescribing the FlexiTouch? Oh, absolutely. So, so for me, like I said, a typical head and neck cancer patient, you know, most of the ones who get to me have multiple issues. So they're gonna go to PT, they're gonna go to SLP for an evaluation unless I already have a BFSS and a clinical eval within the last few months. And they're going to go to OT if, if I didn't need PT for other things that I, you know, send them to either. Um, and they're going to get a clinical evaluation. They need to be educated. They need to learn how to do self-MLD. They need somebody to, to really follow them and get, get this started. And then we're going to use the FlexiTouch as sort of a maintenance thing. Because I think, you know, most of these patients fall off the wagon. I think the FlexiTouch is extremely effective. We have fairly good data on it. I think it's just so much easier for them to use. And then, you know, I don't have the question of, are they good at MLD or bad at MLD? You know, I really have the question, are you using your FlexiTouch or not? It uh, becomes more of a binary issue for me um, that they're using it, which, you know, takes that out of the equation when I'm assessing how other um, impairments are progressing or, you know, improving in these patients. I have a couple questions about measurement. One, on internal lymphedema, how accurate is the current method of ass assessing internal lymphedema in a head and neck cancer patient? And then what um, measures are you using for external lymphedema measurement? Yeah, so, so the first one's easy. I think they're fairly accurate. I, I think they're, um, I'm, I do not claim to be the expert on this. I'm not the one who's done these studies, but in talking to the folks who have, I think their sensitivity and specificity is actually excellent. External lymphedema is much harder. Um, so for me, it's again, it's more binary. Um, we do not have a good standardized, even with our big, you know, massive rehab program that we've incorporated in the head and neck. Um, 
I'm interested to see what other people are doing and seeing what's been done in the studies. It just hasn't been practical for us yet. How soon after radiation treatment can rehab measures start? Oh, it depends, depends on what you're asking. Um, you know, neck range of motion measures can start immediately. You know, your assessment of if they have swelling or not can start immediately. Um, you know, all of those assessments, you can start doing patient reported outcomes immediately. Um, any interventions that you're going to roll in are going to, you know, start in sort of a stepwise, you know, fashion to minimize the chance of, of really just skin breakdown and infection in somebody who's really beefy and, and hot after radiation. Um, so you'll, you know, it should usually it's fairly obvious when you can start that. If not, the, you know, the surgeon or radiation oncologist uh, will have pretty good guidance for you, depending on, you know, how they feel about things. But in my opinion, it can start, you know, pretty much immediately. Okay. Um, what devices would you recommend for trismus? Uh, another good question. So um, my favorite one is what's called the DynaSplint, the dynamic opening device. Its problem is it's very expensive. Um, there's two basic ways to stretch a mouth. Um, one is you use like a high torque device, which um, the Therabyte is, is that sort of device. You put it in, you squeeze it hard for seven seconds, seven reps, seven times a day. Um, and the problem with that, particularly for chronic trismus, is that the masters, which are so fibrotic, want to spasm down on you. And, it, and it's uncomfortable. So I found myself Botoxing so many of these patients into the masters to try to minimize that. Um, it, the, the, the Therabyte works very well for acute trismus for patients who are getting it in the setting of radiation and you're just starting to use it then. For more chronic trismus, I like the Dynasplint because it has the low load prolonged stretch. You're using it like 30 minutes, three times a day, which is very cumbersome, but it also can be fairly effective for these patients. So great question. How soon after radiation do you feel it is safe to begin stretching and soft tissue mobilization? Also, any concerns with patients using the FlexiTouch during radiation if they can tolerate it? Yeah, so same kind of answer. I'm getting a lot of variations on a theme, which is, is fun because I think you guys are all dealing with the same thing. So again, the guidance is when that red beefy skin starts going away, and the patient is relatively comfortable and they don't look like they have a sunburn where big chunks of their skin are about to fall off, then I think it's fine to start testing the waters, right? I would, would generally start with MLD uh, before I put them in a flexi touch just to see how they're doing it and how they're recovering. And then if they're recovering from that well, then I think a flexi touch trial would, would be fine. And there's gonna be a bell curve. You know, as we all know, some patients are gonna recover from the radiation very quickly and others are gonna have awful lingering erythema and fibrosis and scarring from the radiation. So, you know, it, you really need to kind of test those waters and not just say, boom, two weeks, we're gonna start because that may not be the right answer in certain patients. Are there any differences between male and female head and neck patients in terms of deficits that you've seen? Not that I've seen. Um, I, I see the same constellation in both groups of patients. So um, I don't know if other studies have shown difference in my, you know, anecdotal clinical experience. I see the same things in both patients. Men, um, because they're more muscular, probably get a little less dropped head syndrome because they have more of a reserve often, at least some of them coming in. That being said, I see a lot of dropped head syndrome in Um, here's one. So if radiation fibrosis syndrome gets worse, most likely for the life of the patient, can I expect any positive changes with someone who comes in for me to me with radiation fibrosis syndrome pain? Yeah, so that's actually a very good question. So, um, right. So to have pain, have neuropathic pain is what, you know, I want to kind of calibrate your radar to. You have to have a group of fibers that are misbehaving, usually sending false signals into the spinal cord and up to the brain. If those nerves die, then your pain may actually spontaneously get better. And, I, and I've seen that happen in patients where it just the pain kind of burns out and is, and is really replaced by numbness. That being said, that's, that's not the rule. That's like a rare sort of thing where they will have 
terrible, and usually I would see it like trigeminal pain or anterior cervical pain from damage to the plexus. And it's just awful searing, dysesthesia, and, and eventually it just turns into numbness and they can't feel anything there. Um, let's see, there was one here. Are patients with autoimmune comorbidities at greater risk for fibrosis? Yeah, absolutely. So scleroderma is a big one. I've seen two or three in my career um, where, you know, because of, of the, the scleroderma, they did not do well with the radiation. And I would expect other autoimmune disorders um, would, would, not that I've seen a ton of them, other than the scleroderma would likely do less well. Um, certainly other comorbidities, diabetes, cervical spinal stenosis, bad arthritis, those patients to me don't seem to do as well with the radiation. Um, do you ever use skin grafting to help introduce new superficial lymphatics to the area? Right, so the surgery. So, right, I'm, so the short answer for me is no. Um, I can't think of a single patient that I have referred for lymphatic surgery for head, neck, or breast. Um, of any kind, you know, I, I still think the data there and, you know, maybe somebody who does it will want to correct me and jump up and down, but the data that I've, I've read has not really convinced me that these surgeries really have the kind of long-term outcomes that patients are looking for, or even decreases like the management, right? You have these things, you still need to manage the lymphedema. It's in a little data, maybe they help with infections um, in, in the ex upper extremity. But I have not done that. I mean, if, if there's new wonderful data, I'd be interested to see it. I've heard a lot of surgeons trying to convince me, and they're like, "Well, when I do it, and I'm, you know, and, and you know, no, no diss to surgeons, but uh, you know, but the the numbers aren't usually large enough to be convincing. The controls aren't usually there, um, you know. So I, I just have a real trouble recommending these lymphatic surgeries to my patients at this point." Is, here's another one, is necrosis progressive? Are there treatments effective in reducing necrosis? Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm guessing you're meaning radio osteonecrosis, necrosis of the bone. And the answer is yeah, it can be, right? So, so these patients will get an area of necrosis and that area of necrosis can spread. It can be one of the worst things in head and neck cancer where we'll have to go in and do a graft um, to, to heal it, which I think the one patient I showed you um, at the beginning had radioosteonecrosis and, and a, ultimately a fibula graft is a titanium graft, you know, just wouldn't hold. Um, so the surgeries help. Usually we can get decent healing if we can get some viable tissue that's vascularized from a good spot into that area. Um, hyperbaric oxygen also seems to help in certain cases. You know, at least a, a number of my patients have had hyperbaric oxygen and then ultimately healed ulcers or radioosteonecrosis necrosis with it. Okay. There are a couple questions on the flexi touch, and I can chime in here. One okay. is on the insurance. Are all insurances able to cover the flexi touch? And I will say that Medicare currently for the head and neck does not cover flexi touch. Um, we're working on that at Tactile. But right now, Medicare patients, it won't be covered. And then another one is asking about lymphedema treatment before we can pursue FlexiTouch. And some insurances, most will require that patients have undergone lymphedema treatment, conservative lymphedema treatment for four weeks prior to getting the FlexiTouch. So just if people are listening and they have patients in mind, um, just know those two things in regards to the FlexiTouch. And, and again, my tech, oh, I was just going to yeah. chime in. My tactic on that is I refer them in anyway because I personally never know what the insurance coverage is. So if they come back and they say, oh, they have to do lymphedema for a period of time, then great. And, you know, if they're still having deficits at the end of that, then we'll resubmit for the flexi touch. And just on that topic, would you mind discussing a couple instances of your patients who have had the flexi touch and their experience with it? Yeah, right. So as I said, I I really look at a huge spectrum of impairments in these patients. I It's rare that I see one or two. It's usually multiple. And it's kind of a, you know, I, I, I enjoy trying to 
make sure that I've, I've found everything that they have. So, and, and I will very systematically in my notes go through all of these issues. My notes are organized in such a way that it's trismus, dysphagia, dysarthria, cervical dystonia, drop dead syndrome. And I will go through and kind of, you know, correlate that with the therapy they're doing and the flexi tension. And they'll often finish the therapy after a few weeks, as you would expect. And, you know, they're reporting to me that really all of those issues are better, right? So globally, they're better. It, how, it's hard to pull out the flexi test from the home exercise program. And ultimately, I'd like to have a study kind of looking at this. But, you know, their, their trismus stays better. Their cervical dystonia stays better. They're having less neuropathic pain in the distribution. I've seen just this whole list often do better with the flexi touch than I would have expected had they not had the flexi touch, which is why I start, started using it up front so often. Great. Um, let's Did see. Did we run out of there, questions? No, there are a lot. I'm just trying to read them <laughs> and, and, I, and get the, there's a lot of similar ones. Um, let's see. Are, I mean, what, you might have touched this, but there are a few on what are the other types of things you're asking patients to do at home to try to prevent radiation fibrosis syndrome or lymphedema yeah. like in conjunction with that flexi touch? Yeah, so that's a great question. So the first thing is you can't prevent radiation fibrosis syndrome. We have nothing to undo the underlying pathophysiology. So what we are doing is trying to improve their function and their quality of life. So that is really a lifelong home exercise program. So they're doing their, you know, their jaw range of motion, their neck range of motion. They've got a good hour plus of exercises to do. And again, I'm a doctor, so I am not in the business of actually showing them, demonstrating or giving exercises because I'm just gonna get them hurt. That's why I have a, you know, basically an army of unbelievably good uh, therapists who, who do nothing but make me look good because they're so good at getting the patients to do that. But my guidance is those exercises are absolutely critical. They're individualized each patient. I'll send them back in periodically to kind of renew them and give them something different to do. Um, I have them using the flexi touch as much as possible. When they start feeling better and they fall off the wagon with the flexi touch, I remind them that my reason for wanting the flexi touch is to try to prevent this stuff from coming back again. I don't have data for that. This is going by my kind of anecdotal sense and knowledge of how fibrosis works, but I just want to keep as much fluid out of them as possible so that all those structures will have a better chance to function properly. Um, so they're, they're going to do that. And then everything else is kind of impairment based. I will see these patients three months or six months, even if they're rock stable. Um, and we'll frequently put them back in really just to have the therapist who's really the expert on, on what kind of activities they're doing at home, um, look at them and, and come up with new ways. Because it gets boring, right? It's, it's hard to get patients to do a lifelong exercise program. Giving, sending them back into therapy, even just for two or three sessions periodically is one thing. I will also, particularly the Hodgkin's patients, but also head and neck, have them doing Pilates, which is, is you know, very useful. Yoga, um, some like it. I think the yoga poses, depending on who they're working with, can be a bit more challenging. People can correct me. I don't claim to be a Pilates expert. But the Pilates, these sort of in-kind isometric exercises have been extremely useful uh, for keeping patients in, you know, in, in you know, good shape, high level of function. Um, a couple more more specific ones. Here's a question about swelling of the skin flaps. It seems they tend to swell at the graft site. Do you recommend yep. compression to treat localized yeah. swelling? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's perfectly fine. The, the flexi touch is not necessarily going to make that, you know, it, it, it may make it better, but you may find it, you know, that's your trouble spot. And then I think a garment with, uh, with some vocal compression over that is absolutely reasonable to do. Again, you want to make sure you have a really nicely well healed flap. And if you do this on an acute flap, your uh, surgeon is going to be very, very displeased with you. But yes, absolutely. And here is about um, scarring. I find some surgical incisional scar tissue to be the biggest issue in drainage, tending to yeah. pocket lymph fluid. Other than manual work and scar mobilization, flexi touch garments, is there anything else out there? 
No, you guys are more of an expert on that than me. Those of you who are actually removing this lymph have have your own tricks. So this is one, if, if, if we were in a bit auditorium, I'd be throwing it out to you guys and I'd be learning stuff about that. Right. Great question. Um, have you noticed a difference in radiation fibrosis with body weight, obese versus thin? Um, no, right. What, what you see with the radiation, the, the fat actually gets atrophic too. So you'll have somebody who's heavy with a really skinny neck. Right, and, and the tissues in the field may look, you know, unusually small and, and atrophic relative, but I haven't personally noticed that obese patients suffer any more from the radiation fibrosis. That being said, they do suffer more from diabetes and coronary disease and, and cervical stenosis and lumbar stenosis and all of these other sort of degenerative things that can make them clinically worse even if the radiation fibrosis is the same. Okay, have you had any patients undergo coronoidotomy for trismus with good results? I'm sure I butchered that. Oh, uh, I think you meant coronotomy. Coronotomy, um, yes. Yes, the answer is no, <laughs> right? There's some data on that. There, there, there's also, for trismus, there's also one case report on somebody using a sledgehammer to open their mouth. Um, so, but I have not. I've had a number of patients who've had it, and unfortunately, I've never seen it work. Um, you know, again, trismus is just awful, and it's it's slow, steady pressure, right? The only way you can get this mouth open is to be persistent and more persistent and more persistent. You're getting little microscopic gains. Full cord press means treating the lymphedema, treating the pain. I Botox ambassadors and sometimes the pterygoids, right? And we just keep working and working and working. And, you know, I've got this young girl who came out to me um, who had a you know, a, a pediatric cancer and severe trismus who had multiple surgeries. And, you know, she'd seen everybody before she came out and spent, you know, a considerable amount of time with us. And again, I'm not saying we got her open, you know, huge, but we definitely improved her mouth opening significantly over a period of like 18 months, right? So it was not a, a slow process, but it was really about the approach. Um. What treatment options are there for dropped head syndrome? Uh, great, yeah. So, so dropped head syndrome is tough, right? So these patients get the kyphotic cluster and then here. So what you have to do is the myofascial work to get their shoulders back in their upright lock position, neuromuscular re-education, postural retraining. Like I made the joke, like uh, Austin Powers with you know, freaking sharks with laser beams on the head, the, the therapist will use the lasers and, and teach them the proprioception, you know, because they'll come in and they're like this, and like, how's your head? Look at me straight. I'm like, doc, I am looking at you straight. I mean, they have no sense of, of where their head is in space. So getting the fluid out actually helps that. I think anecdotally, we see tremendously. Um, so we're working on those techniques, right? trying to work on their core, which is also critical so that they have a good a base. And if you can get their posture good, then all of a sudden it's much, even if you haven't made their neck stronger at all, they're able to hold it up better and they get less spasm and less pain just because they're in much better alignment. Now that doesn't work for everybody. So we do that anyway, and, and we do our best to, to keep the neck up and keep their posture good, but we will use a cervical collar in some patients. And the cervical collar, I probably go to the most of the headmaster, uh, which is basically a loop of aluminum with chin rest and a strap. It's not particularly well designed or comfortable, but it's cheap and easy and you have to learn how to bend them. I've done more now literally going on, on Amazon with the patient and saying, and typing in semi-rigid cervical collar and you'll see a number of little designs that come up that are kind of lightweight, just comfort designs, which I've had some, some reasonable success with. If, if somebody can't tolerate those and we go to the custom, it's rare that they tolerate the custom uh, cervical collar. Like I, I don't even know if I can think of a single patient where I'm like, oh yeah, thank God we got the custom collar. You know, if the headmaster didn't work for whatever reason, those are rarely, you know, the, the, the things that are gonna save the day for them. So here, I'll do this question last. Um, we may have touched on this a little bit. It's, it's probably one that a lot of people have. So you have a good understanding of how and why the FlexiTouch and MLD work well for your patients. How can we convince your peers, other physicians, that this is important and that lymphedema is highly prevalent and probable in this patient population? What would you say to them? 
Yeah, I, you know, so, so, so part of the problem is like, well, is it my fault they have lymphedema, right? That the surgeons look at it as a failing where, no, you do the surgery perfectly right in making it lymphedema. So the first thing is really just, you know, to quietly or, you know, subtly give them the data. Look, you know, I went to a very interesting talk. Our understanding from the data is that pretty much all head and neck cancer patients have at least some lymphedema. And that lymphedema may be contributing to some of their other issues. And, you know, I'd be very interested for us to start treating it a bit more aggressively to see if we get better results. You know, a, an approach like that may be useful and it's really going to depend on who you, you know, who you're talking to. Um, again, I'm, I'm hoping anybody out there trying to pitch this is not just pitching it for the lymphedema, but really, I think for the sake of the patients, the sake of rehab in general, is we're starting to look at these patients holistically. We're starting to look at the whole menu of, of functional issues that they have and how they're interrelated. Thank you. So we are at 8.15, already a little bit over our time. Um, we had a lot of great questions, so thanks for taking the time to answer them. And um, speaking on behalf of Tactile Medical, if anyone is interested in more data on the FlexiTouch, there was a randomized control trial that was recently published. Um, it was done at Vanderbilt, and that is available on tactilemedical.com website. And thank you again for attending. We do have two more webinars coming up in the near future, one on September 30th um, on lymphedema therapy basics, and then another one on October 28th on breast cancer-related lymphedema, and that is a two-credit CEU course, and you can register at tactilemedical.com slash learning. So thank you very much, Dr. Soberfield. This was very informative, and it was wonderful. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you.